not find any record of how the name Ludmila got connected with this particular recording. There doesn't seem to be any reason that it should be, except that there was these two women believed to be named Ludmila who were allegedly in the cosmonaut program at the time, before there was a cosmonaut program for women. So what could she have been doing while she was making this recording? Does anyone recognize this bad boy right here? Shout it out, it's not often seen in titanium white, that's what may throw you off. That's the American X-15, the space plane that was flying at this time in history. Could it go high and fast enough that it might be re-entering, that you might say, I'm burning up, I'm going to re-enter, am I going to crash? Well, yes, it did. It was able to go Mach 6.7. It flew into space. Two astronauts actually earned their wings flying the X-15. And since it was operational during the time of the Ludmila recording, wouldn't you expect, gee, I bet the Soviets had something similar? I certainly would. You could see that it flew into space, it got high enough, it could con do a controlled re-entry. You had re-entry heating, which is when Ludmila could have been saying, help me, I'm going to burn up, I'm re-entering. And then it would land like an airplane. So I think it's a pretty good candidate. So let's take a look and see what the Soviets had going at that time. Did they have an X-15 analog or something like it? Now you've got to look at the way that the Soviet design bureaus worked. These were even more political, and they, they worked in such a stupid way, it was hilarious. Each design bureau had a designer who was at the head. And whenever he got in trouble or someone didn't like him, they'd fire him. But when they fired the head of the design bureau, they canceled his entire bureau and canceled all of his projects. And the, the whole program was out of a job. As a result, every time they did this, they had to start back at square one with a new design bureau working on their own designs. This particular space plane, this design bureau got canceled in 1960, so it never got past the drawing board stage. I think it's pretty cool looking. I mean, it looks uh, fairly modern. It looks almost like our lifting body planes that we had uh, flying much later. So the VKA-23, yes, if it had been built, it might be a possibility for Ludmila to have been flying one of those but it just wasn't built. Here's another one, a very similar story from another design bureau, also canceled the year before Ludmila flew. This was called a, a, an orbital glider, which I don't quite understand because it's got orbital maneuvering engines. So, and a main engine. How is that a glider? I don't know, but that's, what it's always, that's how it's always referred to. Again, it never got past the drawing boards. Not a single piece of hardware was ever built. This one, on the other hand, they actually did build hardware. They were going for uh, a space plane fairly similar to the X-15, except that it could take off on its own, unassisted. It didn't have to be dropped from a bomber. It was launched on a rocket. The two versions were called the Cosmo plane and rocket plane. And they actually did do a test of one in 1962, but it was unmanned. This, this little mock-up that you see right here, obviously it has a cockpit. This was actually never built. This is just a small model. The one that was actually built and actually flew was unmanned, and it was really just a capsule that separated from the booster rocket, and then it did a controlled reentry. But that wasn't until 1962. They never flew a manned craft similar to the X-15. And if they did, it would have been after this, which is already more than a year after the Ludmila recording took place. So I wanted to think about, well, what about uh, you know, slow-moving, uh, high-altitude planes? Something that gets high enough that maybe it could re-enter? I don't know, just trying to look at all the possibilities. Remember Francis Gary Powers flying the American U-2 got shot down over Soviet Russia. Can you say Soviet Russia, is that correct? Russian Soviets? I don't know, I'm terrible. Uh, but they made a copy of it. They called it the Beriev S-13. And this one was even funnier, the way that this got canceled. This plane was actually completely built, finished, ready to fly, except the engine wasn't done yet. The engine was behind schedule. It was being built at another factory. This design bureau got killed again, and all of the prototypes were ordered to be scrapped. They ordered this completed plane ready to fly to be disassembled and scrapped. The engineers said, no way. They took the wings off, put it into a truck, and, and kidnapped the plane. <laughs> Supposedly, it's still sitting in a hangar someplace waiting to be discovered. But it, again, it never flew, and that, even that cancellation didn't happen until 1962, after the Ludmila recording. 
So what about just conventional jet fighters? Is it possible that she was just flying a regular conventional jet? Uh, because women did fly uh, jet fighters in that, in that, in that day. That was, not, that was not unusual. The fastest plane that they had at the time was this particular one, this YE-50, which was built specifically to go after the American U-2 and shoot it down. And you can see it's... Sorry, I didn't put meters. How many meters is that? 20,000 meters? Mach 2.8. That's very fast, but it's not fast enough to have re-entry heating. It's not fast enough that she's going to be saying things like, I can see flames, I feel hot, I'm going to re-enter. It's just not that fast. The MiG-21 was an operational plane that was based on the same platform. It didn't have quite the specifications of the YE-150, um, but that's the plane that was already in mass production. So jet fighters, I just couldn't see that jet fighters were a, a plausible match for it. So this next one I think is very interesting. What do you think the requirements for women who wanted to get into the female cosmonaut program were? They had to be a certain size and weight, obviously, because the capsules had a certain size. But what do you think was the one skill that they needed? Anyone shout out a guess? Seducing? Seducing? <laughs> I, I hope I heard that wrong. It was, it was parachuting. When, when Soviet capsules come back to Earth and they crash down, you know, they just land on the ground. The guy's not in it anymore. He actually ejects at higher altitude and he comes down in a parachute. They don't simply get killed when the thing crashes. So they were looking for women who had parachuting ability. Well, look what was happening in the United States a year before the Ludmilla recording took place. This guy, Joseph Kittinger, from Roswell Air, Air Base in New Mexico, so there might be an alien connection here too, he was taking these high-altitude balloons up, to, up into space and 614 miles an hour, that's just shy of the sound barrier. That's almost Mach 1 is the speed at which he was falling. Well, might he get hot? Might he say, I'm re-entering, I'm burning up, I can see flames? Is that plausible? Well, no, the, ex the exact opposite happened to Kittinger. One of his gloves was broken, the seal wasn't working right, and he got frostbite all over his hand. He was freezing to death up there. He never got hot, even when he was falling at Mach, at Mach 1. So, although this is a really interesting possibility, I don't think it's what Ludmila could have been doing. And at that point, I, you know, I'd pretty much exhausted everything I could think of for who this woman was, if she was indeed someone who was up in the air doing something. So, how do we solve this mystery? Go back to the original source of the data and try and find out how reliable it was. In my case, I got my own Russian translators to see if the popular translation of what Ludmila was saying actually made any sense or not. Turns out it doesn't. These, these, are, these are my Russians, except Danko, he's a Bulgarian, but he counts. So this is what the recording is supposed to say. You can find these words all over the internet. Um, I, I've condensed it because it's quite long, it goes on for several minutes, but it's mostly these phrases repeated over and over again, particularly the phrase that's interpreted as, I'm hot, I'm hot. Let's see what she really said. First of all, the words that you see here on the screen were a very small part of the recording. Almost the whole thing was just a lot of numbers. She was repeating strings of numbers, series of numbers, over and over and over again. Sometimes she was counting, sometimes the numbers were kind of random. It would be 21, 22, 23, 24, 21, 22, and just on and on and on repetitively. What does that mean? I don't know, it's interesting. When she says, isn't this dangerous? Help, am I in, am I in a dangerous situation? Nobody heard anything like that. We didn't hear anything on the tape that could have been interpreted as that. And what about talk to me? A lot of these Russian translations are ambiguous. You know, a, a phrase can mean one thing in one context and one thing in another context. And in this case, my Russians thought that she was saying, I will transmit or I will begin speaking now. It wasn't talk to me, it was I will speak now. And as far as I'm hot, I'm hot, there was, this was, she said this many, many times, but I got disagreement. Nobody heard I'm hot. They were saying don't give up and not write. One thing that I thought was interesting was two of my Russians said, she's saying don't give up, and she's saying it to someone in an encouraging manner, like you're doing good, keep it up, don't give up, don't, don't give up. 